Good morning, everyone. How are we today? And the appropriate answer to that question is cold. <laughs> but don't the mountains look beautiful? Yes. And there's real snow up there. Go up to Yarnells, and uh, you'll get real snow today. We've got some. We've had some friends down here from Prescott who came down this morning, and and they had real snow up there. So it's that time of year. We should expect it. And for any of us, myself included, who have lived in northern climes of the United States, this is nothing. <laughs> so if you've ever been to Minnesota, or or Bob Bell's been to Minnesota, North Dakota, uh, Wisconsin, Wisconsin, Michigan, Indiana, North Dakota, South Dakota, you guys, you guys are hardy. Nothing, nothing like uh, nothing like these people here today who are going to whine about this cold stuff. <laughs> anyway, man, we've got a very special program for you today. Uh, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Dan Finley. I'm the executive director here at the Desert Caballeros Western Museum, the best Western history and art museum anywhere. <laughs> And to coin a phrase that I can steal from an old Western television show, that's no brag, just fact. Any event, I would like to give a few commercials here before we get started. Uh, the first is, uh, when you leave today, you'll probably see some activity around the, the museum. Uh, a terrific uh, Native American sculptor by the name of Doug Hyde is opening an exhibition here on Friday. And he is bringing some of his sculptures in right as we speak, including two very large ones. And right outside this door, probably by the time we're done with this lecture, there's going to be an, about a six foot tall uh, statue right out front. I wasn't there when you, you came in. So please, please uh, check those out. Uh, come back uh, beginning, uh, this weekend to see an exhibition by Doug Hyde and another terrific artist, a cowgirl up uh, fan favorite. Her name is Joni Falk. Joni will have uh, an exhibition here as well. So we got two wonderful artists opening shows here this weekend. I would like to ask Kathy Clark to come on up. And Miss Kathy is here to give you a few more commercials. Kathy. I won't make it long. So, uh, but I do have a little funny uh, story. Speaking of the cold, uh, my, my uh, son at home this morning saw the snow on the Weaver Mountains out of our dining room window, and he asked if he could take a snow day today. <laughs> he doesn't know how snow days work, but that was a snow day in his mind. <laughs> so um, anyways, um, can I get a show of hands who all are members here? Thank you, thank you for your support, very much so. Um, for those that are not members, I can help you with that after the lecture today, and the admission rate that you paid can go towards a membership if you would like to purchase, and you will be included on our email list and all of our upcoming events. This Friday, we actually have a members-only preview for the exhibition that Dan was talking about um, before it opens to the public on Saturday. So that starts at 5.30 for members, and I can answer any questions you have about that. Also, right now we have our year-end giving um, time opportunity that goes beyond your membership dues, and it continues to help support our ongoing programs, our low admission rates um, for our um, programs that we offer and for the community, as well as um, all of the exhibitions that you see and our outreach. So, if you um, would love to, I have a table back there, I'd love to talk to anybody about membership and other opportunities here at the after the lecture today. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. There is no question that two of Arizona's best writers and historians, one, uh, her name is Jana Boomersbach, and the other, his name is Bob Bose Bell. Yep. And individually, they have written uh, books, articles, uh, all kinds of terrific information about Arizona's rich history. 
Now imagine if those two were to get together and write a book. It had to be just a ball of fun for the two of them to do that. But we are, in fact, the recipients of the great uh, partnership that these two have enjoyed with one another for many years. So without further ado, I'd like to give to you Jana Boomersbach back here. Come on up, Jana. And Rob goes down. Bob is the owner and publisher, editor, Mr. Everything at uh, Arizona's True West Magazine. And they uh, have frequent, been frequent contributors to that magazine. And I will let them begin to tell you all about their latest book. Thank you, Dan. Um, we have a problem. Uh, threatens the nation. If you have a phone, you know what I'm talking about. If you have a TV, you know what I'm talking about. If you read a damn newspaper, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and Jana and I are here today to solve that problem. <laughs> yes, we are. Because here's the problem. If you love history like we love history, and I think, who likes history? Okay, out there. Okay, all right, all right. You don't like it? No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, here's, the, here's the problem. We got kids coming up, they don't care. All right? Uh, and what the country really needs right now is uh, stories about people who disagree and cooperate to complete, you know, to achieve something that's for the greater good. Where's that story? It's right here in this, in this book, okay? Jana and I, Dan uh, so aptly kind of stumbled onto it. Um, in many ways, this wasn't fun to do. We, we fought like crazy over this book, but we had the cooperation because we wanted to do a book that celebrates something positive in the culture, which is women who rarely get their due, and we, compromise to make that happen. And if you don't buy this book, you're a communist. <laughs> Jenna, your turn. So I like to say that this book is like Little House on the Prairie meets Gunsmoke. Our blazing Sabbath. Our blazing Sabbath. Our blazing Sabbath. Blazing Sabbath is good too. So we had, but we have long known that women and I I think all of you know, that women have not gotten their due. And especially in the West, because you know, in the West, I mean, I love Western men, don't get me wrong, every one of you, I'm adoring of you, but God dang, you can be stubborn guys. <laughs> you can be selfish guys, and that historians are selfish historians because they think that men alone want the West, and we all know that that's BS. So we wanted to tell about the women who also helped make the West. And so we have Donalina Cameroon, and we've got Biddy Mason, and we've got Sarah Bowman, and you've probably never heard those names before. And they're women of outrageous courage and stamina and, 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 and um, fabulous stuff. We, we've, got, we've got all kinds of women from all walks of life, from the women who came out and made their living um, uh, being madams or prostitutes, which was one of the first ways women in the West made their living, to women who transformed the West We've got Charlotte Hall, our very own Charlotte Hall, who stands as a pillar um, in Western history. So we have all of this stuff going on, and we thought it was time that somebody knew what that was all about. And so this is our COVID book. During COVID, Bob called me, and we're all sequestered, and he says, let's write a book about women of the Old West. Now, he's wanted what to was I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> he's wanted to write this for 30 years. I've been writing about women of the Old West for 20 years. And so we said yes, and then, you know, I think our only problem was that's kind of the only thing we agreed on. We're just going to write a book about the women of the West. We had no idea what approach each of us wanted to take. And since we'd never collaborated before on a book, nor will we ever collaborate again. <laughs> Please explain that. I was trying to explain that story to someone, and I said, Jenna said she'd never work with me again. <laughs> what the that's hell? That's true. Collaboration in artistic endeavors 
I mean, again, I'm sitting here looking at my friend Tommy Martinez, who's a fabulous painter. Would you ever have somebody else help you paint a picture? Of course not. This is ridiculous. You know, I'm sure there are people here who are lot, you know, uh, jewelry smiths and artists and all kinds of people, teachers. I mean, would you ever have somebody else come in and like share half, try to share half of it, and try to figure out how to do it? No, you want to do it your own way. Both of us are like that. It's a community property state. It is a community <laughs> property state. And we're not married. He's married to a beautiful young woman. Okay. So, so that was our problem is that we had both said, okay, yes, we just tore off as it's wants to do, which actually is probably our strength, if not our weakness, in that we just say, we're going to do this and off we go. So my first thought was, all right, let's look at the West. And see, I had the advantage that for five years, I wrote a column for him called Women of the Old West. So I had 60 women already profiled that I had already studied and knew intimately. Only a couple of those women are in this book. I mean, a couple, no, Jana. I'm going to have to call an attorney. <laughs> <laughs> so I looked at those 17 western states, from Mississippi to the to the Pacific, and I thought, okay, one of the things that we have all both agreed on, we agreed on a couple. We did agree on a couple. Of we agreed we wanted women from every one of those states. We wanted every state to be represented. We also agreed that this was not a white woman's book. This was a book about women of every color and every nationality and every type. So we went looking specifically to be sure that we, we covered that landscape because this, of all the places in the United States, this is the landscape that every color woman made. This is the landscape where you will find that diversity and that incredible mess. In fact, it's very old town, as you well know. So we had a lot of that, that kind of stuff going on. And that was the thing that was so much fun. Um, and we did have a good time doing this. I mean, we look back on this now. But it's kind of like, I suppose, when you have a baby and after the pain is gone, you say, why well, not another one, I suppose, because that one wasn't that bad. But in the middle of it, you're thinking, I'm never going to do this again, right? But we, we, we think we birthed a, a book that will bring a lot, of, uh, a lot of women to the fore and will teach, a, a teach and entertain um, and, and enlighten a lot of people about women of the Old West. Yes, and uh, the book is better because I came up from my side, she came up from her. She brought women to the table that never had a voice, never uh, were known in history. And I knew that we had to celebrate uh, some of the, the bigger names, that, and that would be the Klein and James, the Pearl Hearts, uh, those women, who uh, I knew that we had to mix those together. And I think the book's stronger because if I did the book that I set out to do, wouldn't be as strong as Jana and I uh, coming together to form this book. So that was, uh, and I, I would use the metaphor uh, in terms of never working with me again uh, to raising children. They say if you raise children correctly, you'll never do it again. So I said, <laughs> there's a little bit of that. Just to give you a little bit of history, um, back in 1978, I guess it was. Uh, somewhere right there. I thought, well, we need, to, we need to do a timeline book on the history of, of wild women. And I came up with the, what I thought was the most original title at the time, which was Wild Women of the Wild West. This is the 70s, right? The 70s. Yeah. And so then that, I don't want to say he's an a-hole, but that guy who did Girls Gone Wild ruined the title Wild. <laughs> okay. And uh, there were other things, in fact, uh, when I called Jana, well, here's what happened. I woke, I woke up, uh, bought a magazine, raised my kids, and I thought, you know, I never did that women's book. And then I looked around at the landscape and I said, dude, you're a honky cracker. You can't be doing this book like yourself. That's ridiculous. Who could I write this book with? And I, I, there was no question. I immediately called Jana and said, uh, would you like to write this book with me? I think, I think we could really come up with something good. Now, what I had created was a timeline. If you've ever seen my other books, you know that I have done books on Billy the Kid, Doc Holliday, Wyatt Earp, Wild uh, Oak, Hickok, Geronimo, and they're all based around the timeline. I like to be able to know, okay, this, this is the actual date they did this, this is where they went, here's the OK Corral, here's the aftermath, and that's how I like to uh, follow through on them. That was the first thing we threw out. That was the first thing we Well, besides the title. And Jana says, you can't use that title. And I said, well, honey. And then what did you say? So then I said, well, let, me, let me go back a second. And so we tried doing it as a timeline. Yeah. But the problem is you do a timeline with one person. You can't do a timeline with 200 women, right? 
It was too it's unwieldy. It was too unwieldy. So you would get a piece of a woman and then you'd go on other things. And the, and the time and the timeline was valuable, even though I had to rewrite all the damn book, the whole thing. Um, but because I learned stuff that I would never have known without the timeline. Yeah. You know what I mean? So a timeline is always a valuable way of looking at any historical thing because you see the relationships between the two. Let me show you, let me just share with you one of the, the, the best example of this and what happened. It's called the warrior and the and the writer and the and the writer um, um, fighting for their people. And here's what it says: They had three things in common. Both were Native American women. Both devoted their lives to helping their people. Both were led by men who believed they could live in peace with the white man. Other than that, their lives bore no resemblance. It's as though they existed in different times on different planets. Yet they were contemporaries living only a few hundred miles apart. One would be admired and recognized in her lifetime, the other would be hated and forgotten for a century. I would never have known that combination between Lozen and Sarah Winnemucker without that timeline. It was like, the, the minute I saw that, I went, oh my god, these two women were like living at the same time, and look at their lives, how different they were. So that was a valuable thing. So then we went started with, with the Titus, and we went all over the place. I mean, at one point I wanted to do, what did I want to do? I wanted to do some stupid things. Well, we had Grit and Grace. Grit and Grace, we had that. Uh, what was one of your... Oh, um, um, uh, what's that one? what was that one line about, something about women that... Audacious. Were, audacious women. Audacious women, which I liked, but then I did this kind of mean. Thing. And we went on and on and on. And we couldn't, and, and, and Bob was asking every, every person he knew for a title, and every person he knew was giving him a title. Yeah. Because everybody thinks they can name a book. It's very hard to put a title on a book, right? Yeah. And so we're going on, and we went on a variety. And then somebody, I, somebody said, "Let's do the real women of the Wild West." So that made, you know, that distinguished it from, you know, like the Spanish women. And then the way we get the title is Bob is doing a wonderful art piece at in, in Cattle Track in Scottsdale, a collage, and he's going to put it in the Pippin Museum as a new thing. And he decides to name his art piece "Hellraisers and Trailblazers." They give Albertus of Trailblazers, and the Pippin Museum says, "Oh my God, why isn't that the title of your book?" And why isn't that? Uh, you know, I mean, after all of them, so we already had one title, but he forced the guys to go back and redo the whole title. Of course, he is not popular with the support staff. Oh no, it's not <laughs> true. I think a couple of those people would like to see they'll, him dead. They'll, <laughs> they would come to the funeral. So, so that's how we got, which I think is the perfect title for this yeah. book, Albertus. And ironically, I've been giving a speech for years for the Humanities Council. I think in this very room I gave a speech, and it was called Hellraisers. And none of us ever thought of the word Hellraisers. With the Trailblazers, we had that word early on, but we never got the Hellraisers part until you came up. And I look back and went, well, we were both talking about Hellraisers for years, and why didn't we ever think of that word? I mean, sometimes the most obvious thing in front of your face you don't see. So that was that was kind of that was kind of. Well, and that speaks to the collaboration and the, and the fact that uh, uh, we disagreed. Uh, Jenna was dead set against wild women in the Wild West, and, and when I fought her on it, she said, Google it. And so I, I Google it. There's like seven titles with that exact same. Isn't that amazing what uh, Google can do now? Just instant, you know, 1.5 seconds, 25 titles with, with that title. And I went, well, there, there goes that. And so we, uh, we thought about these things. I remember we must have spent uh, a couple of months on real women in the Wild West, but something just bugged me about that. Real women in the Wild West. And I just, I just, and in fact, our art director, the fabulous Dan the Man Harshberger, who used to eat at Jean's Cafe when Kingman would travel from Kingman to Phoenix to play all the teams that didn't want to play us because they didn't want to go to Kingman, so we had to go to Phoenix Christian and Buckeye and Collison and all were and we ate at Jean's Cafe. And we had, in Kingman, well, it was so small when I was there that they had driver's ed and sex ed in the same car. <laughs> <laughs> That's how small it was, Janet. <laughs> But Dan the Man Horsberger, my art director, I've known him since 1957. Uh, he's my art director, and he did a really good cover on Real Women of the Wild West, and I'll send it to you if you want to see it. And it but it, I just, that real just, and, and so when I went back to my staff, I, I called, first I called Jana, okay, 
Because I'm fighting all these people, okay? I, I'm like a lion tamer in there. Get back, Dan. Get back. You know, and I'm trying to stay alive and try to get to a better place. And so uh, we have the title done as Real Women of the Wild West. That's the title. And I call Gianna and I say, do you, what do you think the hell raises the trailblazers? And she said, I, I'm totally in. So now, so now it's me and her against the world. And I have a, a staff meeting on Zoom. I hate Zoom. I, it's my world now. You know what's bad about Zoom? If you guys have never done Zoom, I'm joking, I'm sure you. If, here, here's the problem with Zoom. You're in these little squares. Everybody's dressed above the waist. They've got pajamas on and thongs on them. If they have anything on their feet, okay? And then here's a, you're muted, Jane. You're muted. And they're clicking things. This is the beginning of the meeting, okay? And then, this is what I hate. Somebody's dog starts barking, which sets off their dog. Now everybody's dogs. And I've got to go into that meeting and say, Gina and I are changing the title. And you were there. I, you were there. I had, to, I had to go through this. It's like, arr, arr. I knew I was glad I was on Zoom so they couldn't strangle me. <laughs> but anyway, Dan Harsberger backed up, redid the title, and we came up with a better title. And I was telling Dan before the meeting, uh, before the talk, that what I love, uh, to me, collaboration is catnip. To me. I love nothing more than to go into a meeting with one idea and come out with a better idea. That to me, it, do, it doesn't get any better than that. So in that regard, this book is twice as good as the book I would have written. Oh, twice yeah. as good as the book that I wrote. Yeah. So that, that, that's the good news about her never working with me again. <laughs> Your turn. Well, let, me give, let, me, let me give you the, the, how we found the real women of the Wild West. Let me just read this little part. We know all about the bandits and the bad boys, the gun fighters and the gurus, but nothing about the women who held it all together in the grip of spin. The reality is plain. There never would have been a settled West without the women. Native and Mexican women here first, then black and white women who followed. All settling the vast, unknown, and scary lands beyond the Mississippi River. But they've never gotten their due. If they're mentioned at all, it's as, either as whores or tough to live in a calamity chains. But here's the good news. You don't have to dig deep to find remarkable stories of the remarkable women of the West. You just have to care enough to dig. We care enough. Meet some of the women who should be in every history book. So that's what we promised you in this book. And that's what, and that was, and that was the, that was the joy of it. The whole time, even when we were fighting, it was still, remember what this is about. This is about, this is about showing these women that so they could, you could see them. You could see them with their warts, you could see them with their halos, you could see them with everything. And we didn't try to sanitize anybody. We told you the whole story that we could tell you. And the other great advantage for me is that everybody in the world has had a chance at Olive Oakland, the woman who was captured as a young girl and spent five years in captivity and then was so rescued with the blue tattoos on her chin. Do you remember her? Yeah. Everybody, Bob himself has written at least five articles about him. True, a truest magazine, I, I never had a chance to write about it. And, and everything was on it. Bob said to me, he says, hey, why don't you take a, why don't you take a swig at uh, Olive Oakland? And it was like someone had given me the best Christmas present in the world because I've always wanted to get into that story. I've always wanted to dig into that find out every little piece I could find out. So I think I read five books. So there's all kinds of books written about her, as you know. She's, probably, she's the most famous captive in the, in, in the West. And she, everybody in the world has written about her like, like crazy, right? There's one whole book called just the blue tattoos, right? The whole thing. I got to get into, into Olive, and I had so much fun, I couldn't believe it. I went, my, my friend Paul, he's here from Michigan. He went with me to Yuma to the Historical Society to their library at the library, the historical section, and opened up boxes of things that I don't think anyone has ever looked at and discovered stuff about Olive that nobody else knew. I mean, I was calling Bob saying, I found something brand new about her. I mean, I was, if you don't, any of you who've ever done any research, you know exactly what that feels like. I mean, it's better than sex. It's just the best feeling in the world that you have discovered something really remarkable. 
And so um, I was able to write a piece, and one of the largest pieces that we have in the book is my piece on Olive Oak. And I just want to read yeah, it's the punchline of the book. It's really. the punchline of the book. I just want to read you the very short opening to that book. It says, it wasn't the feathers dancing in the wind as knives shredded the feather bed that you probably helped your mother make. No, that's not what Olive Oak would remember from the day her family was slaughtered by Yavapai raiders in 1851. It wasn't the sickening war whoops she'd remember or the cruelty of that tribe or being saved by the Mojaves or her blue ink uh, tattoo or all five anniversaries. Those memories were certainly there like a shelf of old books already read. But what Olive Oakland most remembered from being the most famous captive white woman in the Old West was that she never wanted to be rescued. <coughs> so that's my introduction, and that's my, that's my favorite part of the whole book. No, that, it's a, that was my favorite thing in the whole book. It's, it's uh, riveting and stunning, and uh, you mentioned research. One of the things I love about living in Arizona is being able to walk where they walk. And that's that's a huge thing for me. And uh, my wife was eight and a half months pregnant with our uh, first daughter. And uh, I drug her, literally, uh, down to where Wider fought Curly Bell uh, in the Whetstone Mountains. And then I pushed her in the truck. She was coming up the trail like this, you know, eight and a half months pregnant. And so then I pushed her in the truck and I drove the tombstone. And I went in the OK Corral and she's behind me. And I and I turned around, and she was weeping. And I think she was having second thoughts. And she was weeping, and she said through her tears, how many times have you been here? I said, I don't know, six? She said, well, once have been enough. And so that's, well, that's, the, that's the downside of being married to me and going having to go where everything happened, OK? Uh, Holly Goldman was captured, or I, I should say the ambush happened, just uh, north of Kilo Bend. And uh, the, the Yavapai raiders who captured her uh, took her up into the mountains, which is above Salome. If you go up this highway, keep going, uh, you get to Salome where she danced. Those mountains look off to the left, that's where she was held by the Yavapai as a slave. And then the uh, she ended up north of here up by Congress, okay? And then she, the, the uh, Mojave came and bought her, and, uh, uh, paid three blankets and a horse, I believe, for her and her sister. And then they walked to Laughlin, okay, basically <laughs> Needles area. And uh, she's, she's uh, held captive for five years. And then when she's uh, freed, or you know, was liberated, they had to go 250 miles down the Colorado River to Yuma. Think about that. that that's one of the things that I love about Boat, is the distances that these women actually uh, travel. And get this, when Olive Oatman was free, uh, made it to uh, Port Yuma, the commander there did not believe she was a white woman. And someone had to pull her hair back and show behind her ear the skin for him to be convinced that it could be Olive Oatman. When, his, when her brother came from uh, California to meet her, they sat for an hour looking at each other and didn't talk. They couldn't. She was so assimilated to uh, the, the native of, you know, life. Now here's the part where Jana, I really gotta give her kudos, is I knew that there was an element of the story that didn't make sense. There was always these rumors that she had children while she was there. And of course, when she toured the country, there was no mention of that in, in her famous book. Uh, I don't know what you do with it. There, there, there's this thing going on in that. But the, um, you knocked me off like a turn off. Oh, I don't know what it was. So, Charlotte Hall, the mother of Arizona, made a comment about her having children. And yet, when she wrote about it, she didn't write about it. The answer to that is in the book. And you have to write okay. it. Okay. Okay. All right? <laughs> but I just love the distances. The Martha Summer Hayes, particular, uh, we don't have time to go into it in detail. It's, it's, it's in the book. Uh, it's just incredible the distances that they cover. And you also see, you, you, the other thing you also find 
is that, in fact, we were just talking earlier when she came in the door, you don't find any wimpy women in this, <laughs> in this book because there weren't any wimpy women to be found. You could not be a wimpy woman at Shabbat I mean, first of all, you had to have, I mean, some women were dragged here. I mean, many women came here very voluntarily. Some came excitedly, but some were dragged here, kicking and screaming. Even those women had to become absolutely uh, rock hard because there was nothing here to help them. It was all, you were all on your own. And talk about having to develop. You talk about the independence of the West, the independent spirit of the West. Where the hell do you think that came from? It came from every single person who ever got on wagon train and came out here. Because when they got here, there was nothing here. It was a terrible land. When they came to Arizona, nobody wanted to come to Arizona because there was nothing but dirt and sage and, and cactus and heat and the snakes and oh my god, it was god awful. You know, and Indians who were then hostile, so then you had to deal with all that. So you could not be a wimpy woman and come to the West. So you learned that all the women who came here would, would shine in some way. But you also learned about the political differences between the East and the West. And the one that I find so fascinating is a woman named Biddy Mason, who was a slave from Mississippi, who walked behind her slave master all the way to California, which entered the nation as a free state. You could not own slaves and be in California, but they gave one out that said you could pass through and take your slaves with you. So her guy settles in San Bernardino and stays for four years and decides to leave. And she says, wait a minute, we weren't just passing through. And by then, her daughter and one of the other young women had found boyfriends in California, free, free black men, who were, became lawyers and challenged and they went to court and Biddy Mason was freed and her whole family was freed 14 months before the United States Supreme Court issued the Dred Scott ruling that said if you're a slave, you're a slave no matter where you are and you have no rights and you cannot sue for, for anything. 14 months before, this woman and her family were saved forever. She would become one of the largest landowners in Los Angeles. Amazing, it's an amazing, amazing story. So you see that, that difference of thought and I think that one of the reasons that we give the, we allow a lot of different thoughts going on out here is that there's always been a lot of different thoughts out here. There's a lot of a lot of different approaches to life, and so I think that we see that in the very first influx of the of the traveler through the whole, whole through the whole history of the West. Yes, and uh, going back to Martha Summerhays, uh, what I love about that story is that she's a newlywed. Her husband's in the army. They're in Wyoming, and he gets papers. Uh, to be transferred to Afghanistan, which was Arizona in 1874. <laughs> and so they leave, uh, and she wrote all this in letters, which was later converted into a book, and you cannot leave here without reading, you gotta read this book, but you gotta read Vanished Arizona, if you've never read, read that. It is a must read to live in Arizona, you have to read it. I read it every once in a while. And it, what's so great about it, and you, I think you'll agree with this, is if you want to read how big the bullet holes were and where the ammunition was stored, read the men's story, okay, which I love, okay? But she, Martha Summerhays, gets into the cooking. She gets into all of the domestic, all the stuff. And I love this part of the story. So he's, he's uh, transferred to Arizona, uh, Fort Apache to be specific. And so they leave Wyoming. They go all the way on the Transcontinental Air, uh, Railroad, which has just been completed. And all the way to uh, San Francisco, they get on a packet, uh, all the troops, and they go all the way down to uh, San Diego, past that, all the way down to Cabo San Lucas. They take on a bunch of cattle at uh, Cabo San Lucas where they, the vaqueros come out and they drive the cattle in the water and they pick it, each, each cow with, by putting the rope over their horns and pulling them up into the hole, okay? She's sick almost every day and wrenching over the side. They come up into the uh, interior of the Sea of Cortez. They get up to uh, uh, the confluence there of the, where it goes into the, the Colorado River drains. And the Colorado River is so low that they can't get the, the boats up in there. Three soldiers die from the heat, okay? They're wearing wool uniforms and it's August. It's 122 degrees, okay? And she notes that they were, they, they were given ceremonial and just put over the side, okay? So they make it up to Yuma, one of the uh, units drops off there, and then they go up to Fort Mojave, which as I mentioned earlier, is about where Laughlin is, Bullhead City, if you know where that is. 
And so then they go up over Union Pass. Now they're on their way to uh, Prescott. And at Union Pass, she's going to make uh, donuts for her husband because she's still on her honeymoon, which she wants to impress her husband. And so a, snores, a, a big dust storm comes boiling through there and ruins everything. She's weeping. And the lieutenant wife comes over and says, I wouldn't do that out here if I were you. So the next day, they go out across Golden Valley. And one of the uh, her husband's in the infantry. He, he walks this entire route, OK? She's in a wagon. And um, one of the lieutenants brought a Irish setter who, from the heat in Golden Valley, runs to his death. And she writes in her diary that night, no civilized people will ever live here. And that's where my father's buried. Right? He lived in Golden Valley, and I think about that every time I go up there. Now they walk, they keep walking. They go into Prescott. They have a big party for him there. Uh, then they walk over Mingus Mountain, through Camp Verde, up onto the Mugiela Rim by Pine, all the way across to Sholo and down to Fort Apache. Now she makes this entire four-month journey, okay? And she puts her stuff in a small abode that they have to live in for the next two years. And she goes out and she says, I wonder what the other women are doing. And she comes outside and there's two women playing tennis. <laughs> and I'm reading this going, playing tennis? In 1874 in, in, in camp, you know, Apache? Yes, and it just blew my mind. And then the next chapter begins, so our son Sammy was born. Yeah. She was eight months pregnant for that whole the whole trip, and that's why there's wrenching over the side and all of it. She was eight months pregnant. Love that story and the distances. I do too. I love that story. I also love this story. She makes a comment in her diary that they so envied the Mexican women because they were wearing light cotton embroidered shirts and stuff and, 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 and loose skirts and everything, and they were so cool. And here she is, and still in her. In her, in her skirts and her petticoats and the stuff that were, they were wearing back east. And she couldn't bring, those women could not bring themselves to break from that condition to adopt the most sensible, realistic way of thing. I've always found that to be a, a real insightful thing about the difference in mentality between Eastern women and Western women. You know, Western women knew on a belly, but you had, to, you had to change. You had to change your clothes. You had to, you had to be comfortable. You couldn't be sweltering and clawed when it was 120 degrees out. Eastern women suffered because that was that was their standard was to wear those clothes. I think that's really really insightful too. Yeah, and the other thing that's uh, so dynamic in this whole story is that you have uh, basically three cultures colliding in this in this very area. You have the Eastern, of course, coming coming uh, from the east out this way, and then you have the Spanish culture, the mestizos and the Mexican culture, which is coming north, El North. In fact, their west is they call it El Norte. For you know, we say Westerns and they go El Norte because that's where their west happened. And then you have all the native peoples. And here's another thing: is that we think of them as being primitive or somehow enlightened. You know, that kind of uh, uh, the light and all that that stuff, which is true. Uh, but the thing that I love about it is the Mojaves, where uh, uh, Olive Oland ended up, were very sexual. And they were very liberated. Okay, the women went topless. What's wrong with this country? Okay, <laughs> kidding, kidding, Jana. I kid. I kid the women in the audience. They know. They know what I'm talking about. But anyway, they were they were liberated. But all those cultures collided here, and I think that's part of why um, maybe the, the West was a little bit more enlightened because of the, the those cultures coming together. Although I'll tell you, it, it, what, what also the thing that makes me upset about the West is how they all tried to beat the cultures out of everybody else. I mean, nobody wanted anybody else's culture. I mean, the, the white people thought, well, this manifest destiny that was going to take over this land and just do it our way, right? Well, the Mexicans weren't buying that because it's been their land for thousands of years. And the natives weren't buying that because God gave them this land forever and ever, and it was their land. So everybody wanted to do it their own way, and nobody could figure out how to blend those things together. I mean, that, and, that, and, and that's the conflict of the West. That's and, the, and when did that change? <laughs> and that has not changed. <laughs> no, it has not, it has not we changed still a lot. Have, We still have a lot of those cultural yeah. kinds of things going on. Um, you know, so.
But yeah, so so there's there's so many uh, so many wonderful stories and so many wonderful things, and we had just had we really did have a great time doing this. I mean, we whatever whatever pain we had, we forgot, we forgiven, and and we're happy to have been working together. And I love this guy. I always say that. I, in fact, I once dedicated a book um, to the man to the guy who brought me to the dance, which is this guy. And that book was Cattle Kate, which I've spoken on as this thing. Who did not make it into this book? But that's all right. We don't care about that. So anyway, we had a lot of different varieties and things. So we had, we, had, we had a very good time, and I love this guy. So uh, I, I told you at the very beginning we have a problem. And the answer to that problem is we need to tell better stories. We need to tell stories that are going to engage the youth. We're, we need to tell better stories that tell who we are, warts and all. We're not perfect. None of those cultures we just named that are perfect. We can learn from that. And I think... This is the perfect gift, the perfect Christmas gift to any daughter or any mother or any grandmother that needs to be encouraged, that needs to be uh, enlightened and have some hope for the world. And if you buy this book, I guarantee it'll change your life. So not to buy some for your relatives. I'm not going to say buy a dozen, but you, it couldn't hurt you to buy a dozen today. But if, and then if we sign them, if Janet and I sign that damn book, I guarantee that someday it'll be worth the cover price. Is that a deal? <laughs> I'm about to be opening up some questions, and then we'll get on the. We're going to have the uh, book signing in the back there, and I brought several cases, so we should have enough for all of you, and we will sign them and make them. They make, they make perfect gifts. Questions from uh, perhaps something we didn't cover? Yes. You mentioned one name that didn't make that book. How many didn't take? It? Oh, about 250, 300 oh, women. I mean, wow. we had, by the time we got done, I don't know how many women we had, all had all together, but we had, we, I mean, there's, so, there's such great stories on the floor. And, and someone said, I think it was second book, we said, no, we're not, because we think we've done our job in making people want to know more. So other writers now, hopefully, will be inspired to also look at this and have new, other eyes look at all this. But yeah, we cut really fabulous women. But really fabulous women are in this book too, so yeah. yeah. The, the best of the best. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Was there any one thread as to why you chose to make it into this? Uh, let me start that and then I want to hear Janet's answer. But the, the great question is there any is there a thread uh, to how we chose? And for me, I wanted celebratory women, women that we could celebrate, women that would be a positive uh, effort. To, to give us a forward momentum in the book. Jana, what was your question? I wanted women who had done something heroic. I wanted women who stood out in the pack and did something wonderful. Um, I was less interested in women who were simply girlfriends of gunfighters, um, or that kind of thing, or who were prostitutes or who were madams. I did write a story about a madam. I did write one story about a madam. Uh, Maddie Silk, who I thought had the best name for a madam I'd ever heard in my life, um, and was quite an interesting woman. But I wanted women who um, who really had done something that, if I sat back and went, wow, that was cool, that was cool that she did that. So, so but, the, but we blended those things, because so did Bob. Bob was also one of those women, too. I mean, not one of these women got in this book because Bob didn't want her in the book. I mean, he wanted every single one of these women in the book. The one thing we absolutely agreed on from the very start, the, the very first thing, was that the first woman in the book was going to be Sakatsu who in 1802, of course, went with the Lewis the Clark expedition on the, the, the great uh, the discovery to, to the Pacific coast, and became, has become the most celebrated woman in America of any kind. I mean, there's more things to Sakatsu than anybody else. And she's also a North Dakota girl. Now, she's a North Dakota girl like I am, only because she was stolen, but that's okay. I, you know, she was a slave at that point. But I, we, we take her, and she's a, she's our our gem. And we agreed that she was the start because the, the, her her lineage, from where she came from, what happened to her, what she did, all the way to her notoriety and her popularity today, gives you the entire sweep of Western history. So we, we agreed on that, and then we and then there were, let me just add you this, there were a couple women that Bob kind of was trying to shove down my throat. <laughs> That's a little pejorative young lady, I just, shove down. 
who I discovered were phenomenal women. I mean, I go, oh, I know. Your vice is really good. And I would get into it, and it was like, oh, that's why he likes her. Oh my God, I didn't know this about her. So there was a lot, there was a nut ton of discovery on my part all the way through, and I think on yours too. Plus, he was illustrating things like crazy and doing these magnificent things. And then we did a whole thing on the Solideras. The, the Mexican women um, who were the fighters of the revolution, who I never knew a thing about until he said, hey, I've, 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 I've painted this wonderful picture, write me a story about it. And I went, oh, go to Google, who are these people? Are they and then you start gathering, you know, start getting in, and I went, oh my God, look at these women, they're outrageously great, you know? So that was happening all the time. One of the uh, issues we have, have, had and have, is uh, uh, guns. And uh, at one point, um, I, I, I included Jenny Rogers, who was an associate of Maddie Silks. So Jana wrote a wonderful thing on Maddie Silks, and I had to include Jenny Rogers because she's notorious, a Denver uh, soil dove. Uh, she's notorious for shooting her boyfriend, and she found him in bed with another soil dove. And when the police came, she gave this statement. I shot him because I love him, damn him. <laughs> what are the was that the ones? defense? Did it work? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's just a, a, I think you just can't make up that quote. It's so fantastic. But the, uh, uh, here's, here's my favorite story of, the, of doing the book with Jana, with guns. Okay. So Jana is in charge of um, Charlotte Hall, and Jana nails her. It's just fantastic. It's one of the centerpieces of the book, okay? So, uh, our text messages go like this. Hey, Jana, did you know that Charlotte Hall pulled a gun on someone? And Jana comes back with this, Bob, please. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, you know, please don't go there. You know. I said, no, no, it's really true. I, I uh, contacted the Charlotte Hall Museum because I remembered hearing a story that Charlotte Hall pulled a gun on a, Ferryman up in northern Arizona or something like that, and I found out that uh, she was doing a book, she was up by a Payenta in northern Arizona, way away from the phone, uh, any phone or telegraph or anything, and a runner, a runner, an Navajo runner comes from Tuba City and says, your mother's dying in Prescott. And she knew that the only, the closest railhead was Winslow, Arizona. And so she went from Cayenta with her guide, whose name, Grover Cleveland. <laughs> and they get into the canyon and the storm comes and he, want, he says, we can't go any further. And she pulls a gun on him and says, we're going. So they, she makes it to Winslow, they make it to uh, Prescott, she gets to her mother. And she, what did you say at that point? I said, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but let me tell you how I would tell that. So we this is one of our great I was a god yeah. Here's how I would tell that story. The most amazing thing I discovered about Charlotte Hall is that she one time pulled a gun on Grover Cleveland. Oh my god. How is that possible? Our Charlotte Hall, the savior of Arizona statehood, the woman who's the museum is named after, the woman who saved the thing, she pulled a gun on Grover Cleveland? Well, okay, it's not that Grover. That's how I would tell that story. So we, <laughs> even the way we want to tell stories, we, we can differ, but both of them are value, valuable and they help you. Yeah. Good. Okay, one last question and then we'll get on to the signing and you can buy all 12 books. Yes. Uh, <coughs> thank you for your wonderful talk here. <coughs> I have no voice. Out of your uh, perusing all the names of uh, the women, did the name uh, Cordelia Crawford Adams come across? Did you come across her? She's a midwife for the Apaches in the Globe area. White, no. white midwife. No. She's in the Arizona Women's Hall of Fame here. Uh -huh. I just mentioned because she's a distant relative of mine, and her sister ran a hotel in Wickenburg in the 1870s. Wow. Yeah, that's you know the, the, the question is, have you heard of Cordelia? Yeah. What's her name? Crawford Adams. Her name is Adams. Adams. Her and father would, used to hang out with Swilling down in the Jack beach. Swilling. Yeah. Yes. And uh, that. Jan is absolutely correct. There's probably three volumes uh, uh, to this book, but it, 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 we keep hearing more and more. Yeah, I was just curious if you'd heard the name, that's all. Yeah, yeah. So anyway. Uh, one more, one more. Yeah, there you want to, yes, right, you were waiting. Well, 
the question is, and this is uh, embarrassing. Uh, back, uh, you're back, you threw me right back to Kingman. So I'm on the baseball team, I'm the leadoff hitter, and we hate needles. Needles is our rival. They're in California. They're all gay as far as we're concerned. Not that there's anything wrong with that. And so I'm the leadoff hitter, and we're in a game with needles. We hate them. And I look over at the sign of the third base coach, and he says, swing away. So I hit a sharp single right to center field. I run down to first base and look out. He fumbles the ball for the throw. And so I turned around backwards and strutted to second base, running backwards. And my entire teammates stood up, and they all yelled in unison, Bozo. <laughs> Cruel teammates shortened that nickname, Bozo, to Bose, and that's where that story goes. <laughs> Don't tell him. Hey, hey, thank you all. We're going to be over here, Janet and I. We're going to be signing books, and uh, like I said, uh, you know, we're done. Thank you.